singing. Please be seated. It's that passage about the sheep and the goats on the right hand and the left. I just can't remember which is which, but there's a majority on my right hand here, so I'm not sure what this side is. Let's just pause for a word of prayer before we begin looking at his word. Lord, thank you again for our uh, day to be in your house with those of like precious faith. And we pray that this, your word, would be of encouragement and enlightenment and strength and nourishment to the soul. May our ears be prepared to hear. May our hearts be prepared as good soil to receive what we trust by your spirit will be good seed to produce much fruit for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. This is the final message for the youth rally this morning. Being an example to the believers, Daniel purposed in his heart a matter of obedience. I trust that the re reading of Daniel 1 this morning was somewhat familiar to your ears was not a strange passage. It's a powerful story of God working through his particular instance in these captive young people in bringing forth their lives, these young nobles who are being prepared for positions of leadership amongst the Babylonians. For these young men, probably in their mid to late teens, experienced language changes, cultural differences, Identity and name changes, being educated and trained under the Babylonian way of thinking and living. But to add to that, there was menu change. Verse 5 again from our text, the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof he, they might stand before the king. The premise was on the basis of the Babylonians that eating off of the king's table, which had to be the very best, would provide and prepare for these young people the very best. And we wanted to train these who were of their captive nations, uh, the, the cream of the crop, and prepare them to be thinking like Babylonians and why not give them the best of the foods and so forth. But down to verse 8, he says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. It would seem that Daniel had no issue with learning Chaldean, changing his clothes, wearing something more appropriate for living in the Babylonian area. Babylonian astronomy and math, learning that. No issue with the name change, but he did have an issue with the food. Those of you who have enjoyed the experience of being parents might relate to this situation with something that may have been at your dinner table. Little Jimmy comes across and he shouts with the purpose, I don't like peas and I'm not going to eat them. Well, little Sally's sitting over here, and she's purposed in her heart because her lips are pinched tight. And you come to understand that she's rejecting what you thought was her favorite fried chicken. Well, you always have your teenager who has the empty leg and is always filling it up, and he finally tells you, he says, I'm a vegan, because Daniel was a vegan. And you look down there in verse 12, give them pulse to eat and water to drink. Pulse, seeds, uh, grain, in other words, vegetables and water. You know. Well, that's not quite what Daniel experienced. In the case of Daniel and his companions, it had nothing to do with fried versus baked, purging out the toxins, eating a Mediterranean diet. It was simply a matter of obedience to their Heavenly Father. And it was a personal choice of what food that they were to eat. The law of Moses clearly forbade the eating of flesh from unclean animals or that which was sacrificed to idols. And, and I guarantee you that Daniel knew what the law of Moses stipulated in these areas. He knew where these meats had come from. 
Daniel also knew that Proverbs gave good counsel on the drinking of intoxicating wine. Interestingly enough, Old Testament scholar Robert Dick Wilson believed that the Babylonians were fond of drinking wine that was mixed with blood. Huh. Don't know what they thought of that. But, of course, blood was a food altogether forbidden for the people of God. Yet you see, to Daniel and those who were with him, they had not only had knowledge, they not only had memorized, they not only had a good grasp of what God expected and what he said and what was right and wrong, but they had an application of these truths applied to their hearts. Daniel purposed in his heart. In other words, that which he had learned and come to understand from God applied within his heart to those things that are true. He purposed, he resolved not to do that which stood against God. He says, I know this is right and I know this is wrong and I've purposed, I've resolved myself not to make it an offense to God. It's an action, a setting of the mind. This is what I'm going to do, or this is what I'm not going to do. And it was all sourced in his obedience to God. Psalm 17, 3, we read David saying, I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. He says, I'm resolved. I'm of a heart position in application-wise that these lips will not say things that will condemn me, that will not defile me, that will not dishonor God. My words. Boy, that's a difficult one. Luke writes in another example in Romans 19, quote, After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the Spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem. Paul says, I'm here, I'm purposed, I'm resolved to go there. He, he says, this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm being directed by God's Spirit, and this is the direction I'm going to. Other biblical examples I thought of didn't necessarily use the word purpose, but I think the principle behind it is, is still valid. Daniel 3, we read of these three young men whose hearts were purposed to obey. In other words, they knew ahead of time, this is what I'm going to do and this is what I'm not going to do. They're familiar verses, but listen. O Nebuchadnezzar, we are careful to answer thee in this manner. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Ahead of time, they knew this is the direction we are going, and this we will not do. And even if it proves that we're not going to stand the test of the furnace, you know, that's fine, but we will not change our minds. Three chapters later, we read of Daniel entrapped by some jealous, greedy politicians. For 30 days, no prayers to anybody but King Darius. That was the decree. But Daniel was resolved to pray three times a day. He had already purposed in his heart for who knows how long previous to that in his life, and he says, I'm not going to change. I'm resolved, I'm purposed within my heart that this is something that I will do as I already always had done, and he could not alter it. You know the results of his resoluteness. He was thrown into the lion's den. Now, although we know that a heart purpose to stay pure, a heart purpose not to be defiled, a heart purpose to obey God, may not immediately show itself as being blessed of God. The examples that we even have mentioned, Daniel being tossed into the lion's den, was it worth it? Could he not for the sake of eh, being ripped apart by lions, you know? Go on YouTube sometime and watch what those beasts do. You know, I'm saying, hungry lions. I'm going to throw in a 
All I have to do is make some little bit of a change just for now. I'm purposed in my heart. I'm resolved to do certain things, but just this once. You know, that's all it would take. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were pitched into a massive oven. Will it be worth it? What harm could come from just a little, a little bow? My heart's right with God. What's going to be so bad that I have to stand out and, and just like everybody else is bowing, why, why can't I just do that? Because the, the, the alternative is, in I go. And although they, they had mentioned before to the king, even if we are cooked in there, we're not going to bow down. You see. I say this because sometimes the answer to what our resoluteness we feel has purpose to bring about doesn't always bring about God's answer, God's blessing. Christians have been martyred for standing for Christ throughout all history. God didn't pluck them out, didn't rescue them, didn't save them always as it was, but they were resolved to hold forth with doing that. You see what I'm saying? I'm taking a stand for God, remaining pure for him, not defiling myself, and you're tossed into the lion's den or into the furnace. Or how about this New Testament example? Then said Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen, I will go before you into Galilee. Listen to this. Peter answered, and he said unto him, Though all men shall offend you because of thee, yet I, that will I never be offended. Whew. Sounded resolute, sounded purposed, sounded like he's taken the right stand. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I deny, yet I will not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. We're resolute, we're purposed. But all of a sudden there's a line when all of a sudden they started to say, eh, maybe it's okay to bow. Maybe it's okay to eat the meat, drink the wine. Maybe it's okay just to do a little bit just for this once. And Peter heard the rooster crow. And all of the others took off. So there are times. On the outside, Peter initially looked like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and he sounded bold for his stand. I'll never be offended. I'll die with you. I'll never deny you. But in the end, he was not purposed in his heart. I say this because when you purpose in your heart to obey God, not to defile yourself, the circumstances that you may be placed in will be, could be, could very, shall be very difficult situations. Things that you couldn't imagine, hard to put together. You'll be quite often misunderstood. You may lose friends, you may be ridiculed, even have people hate you, and in some cases, lose your life at most. But you do not abandon your stand for the Lord. There's a wonderful illustration in the book, Alice in Wonderland. In it, there was a conversation between Alice and the Cheshire Cat. Alice asked the cat, he said, would you tell me please, which way I ought to go from here? And the cat responded, well, that all depends a good deal on where you want to go. Alice says, well, I don't much care where. And cat says, then it doesn't matter which way you go. In other words, if you don't purpose in your heart to obey God, you will get somewhere by default. 
If you don't purpose in your heart to obey God, you will get somewhere. You know, it doesn't matter. It does matter. Because we make choices all the time. We have little decisions and big decisions. What I read, what I listen to, who I listen to, who I spend time with, what I eat, what I drink. All of these things are all decisions in life. And some seem to be major ones. And I can, I'll listen to somebody else to help me along with that, parents or whatever. But then there comes an age that I want to listen to anybody else. I want to listen to my own self. I'm making those choices and making those decisions. So the cat says it really doesn't matter if you don't care which way you go. But we ought to care. So the decisions are right and they are necessary. Good example is found in Joshua 24. Joshua's challenge as we near the end of that particular book and near the end of that segment of Israel's history. He says to the nation, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away your gods which your fathers have served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye shall serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Choices, decisions to be made, purposes to be established. Joshua purposed in his heart that he and his family would serve the Lord, the true and living God. And the rest of the nation, he says, microphone in hand, everybody listen up. You must individually make a choice. You must choose which way to go. You must purpose in your heart. And I go back to Alice asking the cat, well, I really, it doesn't really matter to me which way I go. And then he says, it doesn't matter which choice. If you know your Old Testament history, you know how that turned out for the children of Israel. For the most part, they conquered the promised land. There were some tribes that were left unconquered, some foreign interventions that were there. And then as generation went on and generation and generation, that principle of purposing in your heart for the next generation seemed to be forgotten. We get into the book of Judges, and it seems to be somewhat of a roller coaster spiritual life. We think of the words of Joshua, choose you this day whom you will serve. And Judges 21, 24, it's kind of like a ribbon that ties it all up that whole period of time. In those days there was no king of Israel in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Remember that verse? Joshua says, choose you as a nation whom you're going to serve. And by the time it goes through the book of Joshua and through the book of Judges, at the end of the book, every man was doing that which is right in his own eyes. Had they purposed to serve God? Had they found that that resolve to say, this is the direction I'm going in? It was a disaster. It was a disaster. What do I mean? We had this statement presented before, if you don't purpose in your heart to obey God, you will get somewhere by default. What do I mean by default? This nation, did what it wanted to do. And I think there are times when we as individuals are carried along with the flood of what the nation goes along with. I was listening to a, an interview yesterday on family radio and it was being done about a new a service that was being provided for families. And the man was speaking very knowledgeably, stating that the generation of young people today are surrounded with more information than ever before. And I could be wrong, but I think he said, the amount of information is something like triples every, 
every couple of years or something like that? It wasn't that long ago that it, it doubled in, in every 10 years, the amount of information available. And he said something like in 2020, the amount of information will double or triple like almost every minute. In other words, there's so much information that's available, but he said there's no training. There's no putting it to practice and putting it together. And my fear is that we live in a nation that is being swept along by great information without a foundation of the truths that God's word has said and established upon. Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. And nobody is purposing in their hearts to do that which was right in God's eyes. My college days, I remember the old phrase, you know, if it feels good, do it. If it feels good, do it. And that's how the 60s were. And that same principle prevails all too often today. If your obedience to God is not in first place, then something has to be adjusted. We have to purpose in our hearts. It has to be our guiding factor. It has to be the truth. I think the bigger question is, what is preventing us me from purposing. One I think is plain unbelief. Plain just simple unbelief. There is no relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no Holy Spirit to guide the heart. Wandering and, and there may be uh, on the facade everything that looks right as far as being Christian and so forth but there's no heart changes there. And I think unbelief is there. For many who are believers I think self is keeping us from purposing in our hearts. I can't. I was born this way. It's a disease. It's not my fault. You know? I can't do it. I'm just having struggles within my life what to do. Problem is God's word says that we can by his grace and by his mercy. I think there's a matter of lack of discipline. It's a case of will not versus cannot. I will not do it, or I can't do it. Well, can't doesn't exist. There's the will of discipline in my heart. This is what I will do by God. He will strengthen me to do it. But so many say, I can't do that. But we can, because God can bring us to that. Peer pressure, conformity with the world that we live in. The Apostle Paul says, I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove that which is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I've used the illustration before, and I always intend to bring along a coin. I don't carry coins anymore. A coin and a piece of foil. But I've done it before. If you can use your imagination, take the coin, you put the piece of foil over the top, and you rub the foil, and you pull the foil away. And what do you have on that foil? You have a, an, an exact image, conforming image of that coin, a, a replica of it. And Paul says, don't be conformed to the world. Don't have the image of the, coin, of the world stamped on you, but be changed by what the Lord has given us, the renewing of the mind, to prove, to test those things that God says are true. Purpose in my heart, I will not take the image of the world on me. I think what keeps us also from, from purposing in our hearts, our emotions and feelings. I think fear can dictate my, my actions. I'm afraid to stand for the Lord. And, and again, I think of those men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or even Daniel, put in situations that fear could have controlled them to stand out for the Lord. Fear could have kept them from saying, I can't do that, or this is my Bible, or I need this time to pray, or I need to go to church, and these are things I'm afraid. Peer pressure is so prevailing. Anger can dictate my actions. I think of David and Saul. David being sought after by Saul on through the wilderness. And, and a couple of times he finds Saul sleeping there. And he gets into the cave and he, he cuts a piece of his robe off. And, 
and hollers at him later on. And Saul says, I'm sorry. You know, David could have killed him, could have killed his enemy. Anger could have seized control of it. But he didn't because he had purpose in his heart to honor God with that. I think the same things are true with greed and lust and pride in an assortment of other emotions that I allow emotions of, of whatever sort to dominate rather than saying I've purposed in my heart not to defile myself for God. I set it up. I can't have this. Resisting the leading of the Holy Spirit I think is also a, a, a great key. How many times have we felt God's Spirit leading us in a certain direction to do it? To speak to this one, to pray, to spend time with the Lord and, and not to be beat the remote or on the computer or whatever it is. Allow the Holy Spirit to be the guide, but we, we stifle the Holy Spirit. These are all things I believe that, and many more that are preventing us from purposing ourselves to the Lord. To purpose means to set your mind in action. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm not going to do. Well, let's wrap it up with these thoughts. First of all, as we begin our day, before the day begins, ask the Lord to guide you to purpose in your heart the very things that are necessary. Sometimes you know where you have a, a scheduled meeting or a place to go or a situation that there will be some tension, some, some, some strife, some, some conflict, some circumstances, some horizontal interaction that's going to bring out some temptation. Before we even get there, purpose in your hearts to say, Lord, keep me from that. Strengthen me. Strengthen my resolve. Grant me the ability to say, no, I can't. Give me the peace to be able to do that beforehand. Secondly, I believe one of the best ways is from Ephesians 6. Paul says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore. Get dressed in the morning. Get dressed. Put on God's armor. We have, we have, we've, we've, the, the alarm goes off and, ah, I'm late. We don't put it on. And we enter into a world that we say, well, I've done it before. It's the same thing every single day. But if I've not purposed in my heart and I've put on the armor of God and the truths that God has given me, I stand to be defeated. If Daniel hadn't purposed in his heart three times a day to go to his God in prayer and, and do so, what, what might have been the temptation? I can skip it. I can just do some silent prayer over in the corner. Nobody will see me. You know? Don't even have to close my eyes. God doesn't have to close my eyes. I don't even have to face Jerusalem. Well, maybe I, I do. You know, you can think of all types of things. The purpose in my heart, I begin by getting dressed, standing in, putting on, uh, applying those things that God has given me. And, and you know that. We talk about the armor of God constantly and allowing it to be that which I'm going to do and not do. Applying to that, Matthew 6.33, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek him first, and seek him often. Look for him. Do you love him? Do you find a delight in your walk with the Lord? Then seek him early. Seek ye first. First in time, but first in priority. It's again, not a matter of repetition. I've done this before. I've walked this road before. I've had no difficulties. I've had no hardships. I've had, you know, all of these other things have fallen in. No. Purposing in your heart means I have a relationship with him that I can hear the whisper. 
I don't have to be shouted at. I don't need the two before to be whacked me in the side of the head to say, don't do it. I know it. I feel it. Learn of him. Know his word. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not. <laughs> you know, what is that? That's defiling, isn't it? He says, Daniel purpose in his heart that he would not defile. The psalmist says, I'm not going to use these lips to defile. The psalmist here says, I've hid God's word in my heart. I've digested it. I've made it a part of my life that I might not defile. I might not sin against God. I've purposed in my heart to do that. And the last part, and this is really, you know, I haven't mentioned it at all, obey. Be an example uh, to those around us. Daniel, purpose in his heart, it's a matter of being an example, obedience. Boy, that young person, how did they do that? How, how could they have grown up like that? Uh, look at how they, look what the Lord's done in their life. I'll guarantee that God's word has been a part of their daily diet. Their walk with the Lord has been sweet, not forced. The relationship with the living God has been real. They found obedience not a matter of trials and testings, but they found it as something being natural. I don't read of Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego finding it disconcerting. Am I going to obey God or am I going to obey the king? Oh, what do I do? I don't see that. Maybe I'm reading in between the lines, but it seems like these men were very clear about it. You know, if it seems too good to, you know, for God to keep us from that, we do it, but we're not going to obey, King. You know, we're not going to do that. Purpose in your hearts. Not to defile ourselves. In a world that is full of defilement, learn to obey what God has provided for us. Not as a matter of rote, not as your old school teacher would come around with the, with the ruler, whack you on the back of the hands and don't do that, you know. They don't do that anymore. But as God would say, you know, this is what I want. He said, Lord, this is what I want also. Let's pray. Father, you know our hearts and you know the struggles we have in life. You know how we yearn to walk with you. How we desire so to have that, that relationship with you that you can use in us. We want a purpose in our hearts for every task that we have. In the office, on the school bus, at the, at the, at the store, amongst my neighbors, in everyday situation with, with relatives and friends with people that we are, have, are acquainted with or people that are strangers, that we would purpose in our hearts not to defile, not to sin, to do that which is wrong in your sight. And help us, for we're weak. We find it very hard. The temptations are, are just almost unbearable. But as your word is, is applied, as the armor is put on, as we seek you first, we, we're putting a barrier up, not allowing the world to enter in. We have faith and trust that, Lord, you will equip us to that very end. And the answer to our situations may not come out as we've asked for, but we know it's been the right thing to do, and you'll be honored. Bless these seed thoughts to our hearts in Christ's name.